let me introduce uh, a substantive topic within professional ethics. And let's get started this way by asking you what the idea of a profession or a professional conjures up. And start not from the book. Don't start with things that, uh, that you've read, but start from your own experience independent of this class. I mean, what's, what's, what image do you conjure up? I mean, is it, it might not be anything like what's, what's in the book here, what I just read. What do you conjure up when you think of professionals, professional as an adjective, or professions? Mm -hmm. And loud so the people in the back can hear, please. I guess like somebody, if you, if you like, somebody who will give a service and will do it up to a, um, a standard, I guess you would say. Okay, so there's someone who is, will provide a service, and the service will be, will measure up to some objective standard, would you want to say? Yeah. So that's one thing that might, an image that might be conjured up in your mind if you hear the expression professional or profession. Anything else? Anything that conflicts with that? I mean, because the English language, as I'm sure you know, is, is, uh, is very ambiguous in a lot of different ways. That's one of the reasons that it can grow, because there's a lot of different connotations and different meanings that are attached to terms. Anything else that's associated with profession? Uh, maybe, maybe it's just someone that you could put your trust in to do a service that you yourself weren't trained for. So it's somebody who has maybe a knowledge, some knowledge that you don't have, or a skill that you don't have, and you turn to them in order to accomplish a certain end, and your suggestion is that, uh, that uh, there's a legitimate expectation that this, uh, this job will be performed up to certain objective standards. Good. I think that those are, those are accurate uh, portrayals of some of the things, some of the trappings, some of the connotations that uh, attach to the word <coughs> profession, professional. There might be, there might be um, differences between what you hear when you hear the word profession and then what you hear in the word professional. So sometimes these words you know, have kind of odd nuances, subtleties, uh, depending on how they're used. But what were you going to suggest? When I was really young, I was... I was pretty much, the, pretty, the definition was professionals got paid to do it. Do so, it. professional versus amateur. I mean, uh, an amateur, I mean, anybody who gets paid for doing a certain job might be considered a professional such and such. Hell with how good they are at it, and, and doesn't matter much, you know, whether they know an awful lot. If they just get paid for it, then that's professional, because the word professional sometimes is used to be opposed to amateur. And all that matters is whether you get paid for it or not. And someone who's very, very, very good at something, but doesn't get paid for it, might still be regarded as an amateur and not a professional. So there's another one of the, the tricky characteristics of this word. Uh, in, the, uh, in, in, in another class of this same kind, uh, one of the first things that came up is that some people heard negative connotations attached to the word professional. And uh, indeed, when we discussed that passage, when this, the, this, the, a student brought this passage to my attention and, point, and said that he didn't think that this really was at all the expectation that he thought most people have when they thought of professionals. Professionals, I'll read this again, professionals are expected to be persons of integrity whom you can trust, more concerned with helping than with emptying your pockets. They are experts who by the use of their skills contribute to the good of society in a variety of contexts for a multitude of purposes. And they are admired and respected for the manifold ways they serve the growth of knowledge and advance the quality of human existence. Some people, when they hear the word professional, don't have these expectations at all. Yes? I was going to say, when I first read that paragraph, I thought of, you know, yes, my family doctor, uh -huh. but not the lawyer I go to on the weekends. You might not think, so there might be distinctions I among think... professions. You might not think of, uh, the lawyer as fulfilling some of these, these hopes as much as you would uh, think of the doctor as fulfilling some of those hopes. And, and there are problems in uh, that, you know, I guess different people have different experiences with their doctors. So I'm not sure that everybody's experience with their doctor will be all that uh, glowing and effusive. How about a professional criminal? Do we expect any of these things? I mean, the word professional is, is applied in that context, right? 
what would a professional, what would be the mark of a professional criminal? I mean, again, it probably wouldn't be somebody who gets paid for it. I mean, there's not how many amateur criminals. I mean, maybe there could be. But, uh, but I mean, you know, if people, the breaking and entry, you know, like people who do or sort of knock over the 7-Eleven, I don't know whether you would think of them as professional criminals. What's a professional criminal? Hey, I was going to say someone that, you know, can break a vault in 30 seconds and walk out with a million dollars. I mean, you know, hey, it's a respect. little slower and louder so they can hear in the back. You know, someone that can break into a vault in 30 seconds, walk away with a million dollars and never be seen. I think, you know, he has respect among his peers. Oh, but there's a great high skill level oh, there. Yeah, you're talking about. The suggestion is what about somebody who can break into a vault in 30 seconds and walk away with a million dollars undetected? You know, all those movies, I have the Pink Panther movies, and, uh, and there's, there's, there's just must be thousands of them, in which actually the, prof the, the, the person who's really skilled at uh, breaking an entry is, is kind of glorified. But they're a professional criminal, I guess, uh, to the extent that that expression makes any sense in uh, the English language, would be someone who's extraordinary, extraordinarily skilled in what they do. Or not extraordinarily, but skilled in a difficult task, able to do with some skill uh, something special, something that not everyone can do. Now, there's, there are a few problems with that. Um, for example, sometimes we might say that uh, some professional doctors are, in fact, not highly skilled. And I think that this is just one of those places where the English language allows ambiguity. I mean, certainly it's possible for someone who is a professional attorney to be not very good at it. I mean, they might get paid for it, for example. They might have all the credentials in the world. And I think uh, those sorts of cases have to be addressed. But let me, you know, without getting into too many subtleties, let me just uh, suggest that at least one basic element that uh, is, uh, plays some role in almost every understanding of profession or professional is this idea of being competent at something that not everybody is competent at. It's something that's fairly difficult. So let, let, let's, uh, let me ask you a question about um, another term. Again, starting from not anything you've read here, but starting from your own understanding of the English language. This is also a useful research project for me to ask normal English users how they understand these terms and to check my own uh, feelings about them against yours. What about the term ethic or ethics? There's a couple of cognate terms, related terms, that might have different implications. What do they mean to you? What do you understand when you hear about ethics? What is that? Yeah. Something that might be viewed as correct by society. Okay, something that might be used, uh, might be viewed as correct by society. Could society, could, could, can what, can what society views as correct be nevertheless ethically wrong? Yes. So not everything that's, I mean, if that's correct, if then, if that, if that's true, then not everything that society views as correct is ethical. So there's a confusion or a potential confusion there. Um, what about, uh, let me ask about a special one that's particularly related to professional ethics. Let's say, what, what, what do you make of the term business ethics or business ethic? What would that mean? What do you think of when you hear that expression? Maybe not to uh, cheat people. And, uh, like in order to be a businessman, you should in it to help people as well as earn money. Now that's interesting. I mean, that, your, your suggestion is that business ethics would be something like not cheating people and trying to be in it, being in it to help people rather than to make money, which of course all businessmen are in it to help people, not to make money, right? No, you laugh. <laughs> but uh, in any case, you suggest that, whereas in, uh, in other contexts, somebody might suggest something quite different. What were you going to suggest? Uh, maybe the standards and values set by both the public that they're helping and within their own workplace themselves. Well, I'm, I'm very pleased to hear this. Some people, when they hear, hear the expression business ethics, think that it denotes some special rules within the business community that, that business people feel are acceptable but which would not be allowed in another context. 
Now, does that make sense? I mean, does that, does that ring true to any of you when I use the term business ethics? I mean, some people use the expression that way to mean uh, some special set of rules that, in fact, might be able to trump regular ethics. Because you can say, oh, well, it's business. Uh, how about, you know, I don't know, this, this is sort of stretching it, but sometimes people talk about a street ethic, a way of being that's acceptable on the street. It might not be acceptable anywhere else. Or a business ethic, or an ethic within a particular institution. Um, rules, special rules that might be applied within that institution, but which wouldn't be acceptable uh, if you weren't in that institution. I mean, that's one at perfectly legitimate understanding of what is meant when we talk about an ethic. That's not what we're going to be talking about here. And indeed, there's a presumption that I want to just sort of announce uh, that will guide pretty much what we do throughout the quarter. Uh, I'm using the term, and I believe the authors of all the articles in your text will be using the term professional ethics, business ethics, medical ethics, engineering ethics, not to mean special sets of rules that are opposed to sort of normal, regular ethics. Instead, I think the presumption throughout is there's just ethics. There's considerations of what's right and what's wrong. Uh, there's also an acknowledgment that these considerations are very complicated. And determining what's right and what's wrong in various situations will require understanding the circumstances of the situation. And professional settings just <coughs> are, are, are a, a characteristic kind of setting within which people have to figure out what's right and what's wrong. So when, when the term professional ethics or business ethics gets, gets used here, um, I hope you'll understand that we don't mean, and I, I, think, we're, I think we're probably at one here, because I didn't see many people nodding their heads when I said, well, business ethics might mean some special set of rules that, that are opposed to normal ethics. Not many people seem to think that that rang true, but sometimes people do. That's definitely not what we mean here. We talk about business ethics. We're only talking about an exploration of the various situations and challenges that confront people as they do business, for example, uh, and in their attempt to try and figure out what's right and what's wrong. And the same for any professional ethics. Uh, enough of that. And then having, having said that, I want to remind you that there are, I mean, something that I think should be pretty obvious. There's two different perspectives that any one of us can have on these issues of professional ethics. I mean, one is kind of internal, as a potential professional, or as a prof professional right now. Well, I'm standing before you as a professional of some sort. I mean, some, you'll find that some of the authors want to re reserve the word professional for some of the for professions like uh, law and medicine and other occupations they don't want to call professions. I think that, in my own view, that's an overly narrow and restrictive use of the term. And I'm not sure what, beyond an historical justification, that usage has. Uh, but I, I take it that I'm a professional teacher. I'm a professional philosopher. It seems to me that that word is used appropriately in those instances. You are, I think, in every case, to the extent that you're on a career-oriented track here at RIT, you are embarked upon some profession or another. Uh, some of you may be more clear in your minds which profession that is that you're, you're on the, on the tr in pursuit of. But uh, I think the whole objective of an RIT education is to sort of guide people toward careers and professions that, uh, that, that uh, they can then pursue beyond the walls of RIT. So you have the potential of being in a profession, or perhaps in many cases you are already in that prof profession now, and there is an internal perspective uh, that's important here. You have to ask yourself, what will it be like to me trying to make decisions about what I ought to do in these very complicated situations I get into once I'm out there uh, on the job in my career? But 
<coughs> Beyond that one, there's the other perspective. We are all consumers of uh, the services and the goods provided by other professionals. And we all of us have some reason to be concerned that we're treated ethically and we're treated in the way that we have a right to expect uh, by the professionals that, uh, that confront us and who offer us services. I mean, you paid money to get into this classroom, for example, and I'm standing here before you having uh, uh, raised certain legitimate expectations on your part about what you're going to get. You should get an introduction to ethics. And I've made it clear that what we're going to try to do is, to, is to, to seek out an introduction to ethics in this realm of the life of a professional. But you have, again, these two perspectives. Either the, you, know, you can think of yourself as being a potential prof professional and what it's like from the inside, but then also think of yourself as a consumer of the services offered by professionals and see it, therefore, from the outside. And I want you to be, feel perfectly comfortable about bipping back and forth from both those, uh, both those perspectives. Uh, and part of, this be, uh, part of the fact of this being a philosophy course uh, means that uh, I need you to be critical of the things that are in the book as well as the things that I say. So that if I, uh, if I or if any of the authors of the book make some claim that seems to you to be unsupported, unfounded, or just plain wrong, that's a good time for you to interject your own view. But we will be trying to pay attention to the arguments that are offered by uh, these various authors, for example, and by me uh, in, in behalf of their thesis. So it's important not just to say, well, I disagree with that. It's important to try and pinpoint why. OK, so one thing, going back to your original uh, request for clarification, one thing I hope you'll be doing as you go through here is uh, realizing that these are not supposed to be pronouncements that are written in stone. Sometimes, as is in my view, in the case of this uh, original uh, pronouncement in the text concerning what professionals are supposed to be or what we, how we regard professionals, uh, it's perfectly possible you won't agree with that. And that's a good thing to bring to class also. OK. Um, Another thing I wanted to clarify with you in this introductory uh, lecture, uh, and again, is to, and solicit information from you, is what does the idea of whistleblowing conjure up? And hear the term whistleblowing. What does that mean? Tell me anything you think of. Whistleblowing in a professional setting. I guess it often comes up in, in, in engineering settings. Yeah? Um, when you say that, do you mean they saw something wrong? Outside of the, um, we saw something wrong that was that was uh, that went beyond the boundaries of of their expected ethics. Well, I guess I, I'm 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 I I probably talked more than I should have. I really wanted to get what you understood by that term. Now maybe it's just a foreign term, but I suspect not. I suspect it's something that comes up from time to time in the news, or it has some meaning to you. And so rather than tell you what I mean by it. I'm trying to find out what you understand by it. Yeah? Like, would it mean a healthy an example of whistleblowing? Well, why would you say that? I want to find out what you and how you understand the term. She, she waited so many years before she actually came to a point to say that, that what he had done would have been wrong. And then it finally got to a point where he was going to the Supreme Court, and she said, no, I've got to say that this is I wrong. Think that, I think that that's right. I think that that's the way that she, she uh, uh, came forward. Um, what I'm interested, though, is what is it in that case that would constitute the whistleblowing? I mean, what is it that makes that a case of whistleblowing, in your view? Is it just saying something's wrong, or what? It's, it's putting, putting an act to what you're saying. I mean, she, she actually pressed charges on him. Okay, so it's, but it's, it's a matter of going outside. Yes. Occasionally, they'll play like TV shows about or specials about someone who worked in a company and they saw maybe the company was illegally doing an act and then they'll publicize it uh -huh. and they'll make it public. Uh, I remember, I don't even know the show, but she found out how they were illegally uh, uh, changing. A reporter? Or she, uh, found uh, one of the workers uh -huh. was going through some files and found out there's smuggling something or something with funds were being misdone for the president and was making some side money and then he, she went to the reporters and made a big thing about it. 
Okay, okay. But, uh, but so that she went to the reporters. I mean, so that she went outside the organization. Any, there's a hand over here, yes. It's something that's outside the standards and values set within the company, business, profession, whatever. So, and then therefore something that happens within that, they're being basically tattled on, in a way, in a sense. All right, so but, but, appealing, the but going beyond, right. going yeah, out, out, I, I think that that's what the, that seems to be what I, that's what I would have thought too, is it's, it's a matter of not just, you know, saying something's wrong, because you might say that to your boss, and your boss might say it to her boss, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's not just saying something's wrong, it's uh, going outside and bringing it to, to public attention. Now tell me what you, now having characterized it in that way, I, I'm, I, um, I uh, have reasons to characterize it in that way. I want to know what you think of that practice, that activity. I mean, I, anything at all that you might think about it. Is it appropriate? If it's appropriate, when is it appropriate? Yes, sir. I think it depends on the person, because some people do it for different reasons. Um, they might be looking out for the interests of the company in their perspective, but other people might see it as, or they're telling on the company, or they're just looking to get ahead, so they're going to they're trying to break down somebody by telling them, by telling the public something about the company, something about the person. So there could be a variety of different sort of motivations for doing that. Um, that's important. Uh, I want to stick to to this. And again, I think you're doing that. I want to make sure that, that we're offering an ethical analysis of whistleblowing. Uh, you're pointing out that there might be some circumstances in which it's done for reasons that aren't necessarily ethical. Like, for example, when someone's trying to bring uh, a superior down, is to, you know, to, to hurt somebody by uh, reporting something that they've done. Yes? I believe that by taking it outside of the company itself, um, it's causing the company to react and respond to the problem instead of covering it up. So that there's a greater likelihood that the, co the company might actually uh, respond to the problem you're suggesting, if you uh, apply a certain pressure, you take it outside the company, than if you were to handle it strictly within the company. Always true? I mean, I, these are all, all good ideas. I'm, I'm interested in, 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 uh, in, in how you're reacting to what the others are saying, as well as what I'm saying. Yes? I think a lot of the time that if you went to a professional inside the business and you said, well, this, that, and the other thing is going on, and you need to, they don't really do anything about it. I mean, they'll say, okay, I'll talk to my superior about it. And then, and unless you do do something outside of the business, then sometimes a lot of things aren't done about it. Just because they don't want to have to deal with it or have to go to a professional about it because it may be that it's their responsibility. I've covered this a long time ago, and it might be, you know, their problem that they might get in trouble for it. So unless you do go outside of the business, a lot of times think things just get piled up and up. Nothing and will happen. It'll that. just get covered up. Uh, and so oftentimes this is, this is what happens. But what, what if that's the first thing you do? What if you see a problem and the first thing you do is to go to 60 Minutes? What do you think of that? It's not ethical unless there's sufficient evidence to bring it out to the public. So it, you're saying that in cir circumstances like that, it might not be ethical to go outside if that's the first thing you're doing. What were you going to say? In fact, I think it's appropriate uh, when your views and your ideas are not being listened to and not being followed. Um, I think it's only appropriate to go outside and go to a superior authority when, when nothing is getting done or nothing's being listened to your ideas. So if it's the first thing, if your first inclination is to go outside the company, it might not be the ethical thing to do if you're not giving the people inside the company a chance to take care of the problem. So, but if you get into a situation where you learn from experience, for example, or, or have other reason to believe, I suppose, that, uh, that uh, referring matters through the normal channels won't work, your conclusion is that maybe then the, the, what you have to do is to go outside the normal channels, go somewhere else to apply the pressure in order to make things happen. Other reactions? Why are authorities and companies, I say this as someone who resists authority in all kinds of different ways, so don't get me wrong, but I have to ask this question. Uh, it seems to me that in what you say there's a presumption that if I go to an internal authority, someone who's my boss, and they don't act on what I suggest, there seems to be a presumption here that I'm right and they're wrong and that it's okay for me to go around them and try to get it done some other way. 
if I can't get it done from within the company. Now, I know that's not what, I don't think that's what anybody meant to say, but how are we to figure out when it's appropriate? I mean, when we have a disagreement about something with, 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 with our con uh, company, when is it appropriate to go outside and when not? And why? What is it that makes it right to go outside the company or not? Yes? If the company is doing something wrong and they know they're doing something wrong and it's causing harm to other people, whether it be ripping them off or physical harm, then it would be right to take it outside the company. Okay, so if the company is doing wrong and knows it's doing wrong and the wrong it's doing is harming people, then I suppose by virtue of one's obligation to society, then one may, anyway, whistle blow, blow the whistle. I think whistle blow, it's, it's in my mind, a, you know, it's a moral judgment right from the beginning. And the fact that if you do take this information outside um, the business, the company, whatever, you have to be right. If not, you're a disgruntled employee. I think that it's, you know, you could be wrong, theoretically, yes, you and you know you have to prove to the public, everyone around you, that you are right, and that, you know that's that's a big risk. It's a moral a risk. It's a risk you're taking, especially when each of us knows, deep down inside, no matter what face we try to put uh, before anyone else, we know we're fallible. We make mistakes. We know we're not always right, and when we're faced with several layers of persons in the hierarchy of our company who just disagree with us about the, the, the wrongness or the dangers or whatever it is of something, it's uh, sometimes very difficult to have the confidence and the will to go on. What about one's obligation, I mean, what about obligations to the company itself? I mean, one of the, they kind of crept in a moment ago when I asked you, what about going outside the company first thing? One reason to say, well, now, you shouldn't go outside the company first thing. You should first try their procedures, the normal uh, procedures, the normal chain of command to see if it works. One reason might be you have, that's kind of an obligation. You owe it to the company. It wouldn't be fair for you not to give the company the chance to, uh, to change its ways. So, I mean, the, your obligations to society are there. Uh, and they're kind of amorphous. You may have particular obligations to particular persons, clients of the company, for example. There are obligations then to your employer. And then here's a tough one. I mean, you've got obligations to your, to your family. You're trying to feed your family. You're trying to keep your job. And sometimes uh, they might certainly make things difficult. And it's easy to say that, that decisions that people make not to blow the whistle, not to make noise, are done out of sheer cowardice. But sometimes they might be done out of a sense of obligation to keep that job, not just for themselves and for money and for all kinds of you know, greedy, evil things, but sometimes because they have to keep bread on the table. And there's obligations in there, ethical obligations that people have. I mean, um, I think if, I, uh, this is a, a, a view I have that certainly is, is, is um, open to question. But I ask for your reactions as well. I mean, if somebody were to spend their lives uh, constantly, I mean, let's say they had a family, but they spent their lives ignoring the welfare of the family in order to serve some abstract goal of society, I'm not sure what, what I would think, all things considered, of that person. Now, this is a real touchy subject, because often people who are some of the greatest social changers in history some of them also are people who neglect their families. But it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's, an, it's an interesting issue. It's an ethical issue to decide what, uh, what to do. And I think if I understand what you were suggesting, these, aren't, these, are, these are judgment calls. And they're not easy. They're tough. Uh, they're ones that we're all going to be faced with from time to time. Uh, does one have a kind of any ethical obligation to be a hero? I mean, sometimes the decisions you have to make in order to blow a whistle to stop things, sometimes I think that they fall in the category of the heroic. And that has to be taken into consideration as well. I mean, do we have obligations, ethical obligations, to be heroes? What do you think about that? 
Yeah. I was going to say, in certain situations you do, like in society, like if you see somebody getting attacked, you have an obligation to stop it, you know, as a member of the society. An obligation? Even at the, at the risk of your own life. There's a story, there was a story in the local news, I'm not sure how many of you for, are from around here, on Thanksgiving Day when somebody was returning from, uh, I mean, this is like a, the perfect story. I mean, somebody was returning from uh, helping out at a place where food was being given to, to, to people who were you know, not very well off. And uh, they were you know, driving along the street, I think headed for their own Thanksgiving dinner. And the driver of the car looked out and saw somebody being beaten in the street. Did you read this story, some of you? Did you see this? And uh, he jumped out of the car and went to help the person who was being beaten in the street. Uh, actually, I think did successfully chase away the attackers. And then I think the person who was the victim also ran off. And then, I'm not sure that this was ever confirmed, but it appeared to the reporter in the story that I read that the victim's friends who were nearby thought that this was the guy that had beaten up the victim, so they came out and started beating him up. And he got pretty severely beaten. He almost had his arm torn off. Um, the question is, and this is a real interesting question in the modern world, where you, you're at risk of this stuff almost everywhere you go. Do we have obligations to be heroes? You've said something that I'm actually gratified to hear uh, but it surprises me to hear that. That you say, yeah, you think that we have an obligation to, to be a hero. Con discussion of that point, please. I don't, I mean, I, I have to say, I, I, I'm torn. My own personal view is not that we have an obligation so much to be a hero, but this is a great, I mean, this is a great thing to be. I mean, it's something that's inspiring. It's something that, uh, uh, I think everybody would like to be in their heart of hearts. I mean, even in a world that's sort of marked as, uh, as cynical, I think people still would like to be moral heroes. But is this something that's, that you owe to anybody? Any, yeah? Speaking about something like a violent thing, I was driving down, you know where Lake Avenue is? Sure. It goes right up to Charlotte. And yeah. I was driving down Lake Ave, and uh, before um, Park, uh, Kodak Park, you know, where all the, the car dealerships are. And before that, there's a, a bus stop and a gas station. And at the bus stop, I was sitting there with a friend in the car at the park, at the light. Mm -hmm. It was red. And at the bus stop, there was a guy with a gun shooting his gun through traffic and in the air and all over the place. And I'm sitting there going, now, where do I go? <laughs> what do I do? Yeah. So, I, of course, I, I ran the red light to get out of the, mm -hmm. the situation. Because the man was, uh, he must have been on drugs or something. Flipping the gun around, shooting crazy. I'm going, oh my gosh. My friend next to me was freaking Probably out. wasn't on drugs, actually. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably why I went. Um, and the next day I read in the paper that two people died. I don't know if it was that situation, but two people died on Lake Ave. Uh -huh. so, from, I mean, from sniper stuff. Yeah, so. Well, I mean, the, the, we're in a world where this is happening, you know, in, you know, in the suburbs, it's happening everywhere. I mean, there's just no, uh, I mean, it, it's, it, I, it's easy to exaggerate the dangers of modern life. I mean, I'm not dead yet, but it seems scary out there. And I, you know, like I think most of us, you know, sometimes think about it as sort of scary, but on the other hand, you got to live, so you go ahead and you live and you walk through the world and do what you have to do. Is, does everybody agree that you have an obligation to be a hero, just to, to, go, to go out and, and, and help at the risk of your own life people who are the victims of Innocent. Let's presume that these that the victims we're talking about are innocent victims of, of violence. Yes. I don't believe that you have an obligation to be. I believe you ought to. You know. It, it, you ought to do it, but you don't have an obligation to. You you know there is no obligation. It should be done, and you should stop. You know, if you see something bad going on, you know, you should be smart enough to like try and break up the situation if someone's like really getting beat up or something. Mm -hmm. But you don't owe it to anybody. It's just the right thing to do. Uh, come, we'll go over there and then back to you, right there, and then I see you too. I, I, I think being a hero is, you know, it's all a perception thing. I don't, I don't know whether being, you know, kind of a Rambo hero or going into 
uh, a crowd of a thousand people and saving them is, you know, you're necessarily, you know, that's a definitely a heroic thing. But you know, a lady that works uh, as a nurse for 35 years, I think, you know, it's, it's all a perception thing, and I don't know whether, in my mind, you know, uh, going and, you know, taking a gun out of someone's hand in a supermarket is bordering on insane. I think you have to be a hero after that. But I don't think you necessarily well, have to go to that length. Examples that we've been thinking about, that, that we've uh, placed on the table here, so to speak, to have been sort of Rambo-like, I mean, where you're supposed to plunge into situations of violence. Uh, I want to broaden it. I don't think that uh, those are the only questions. Do we have obligations to go um, uh, to, 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 well, I mean, it's hard, it's hard for me to put this in a way that doesn't beg the question. I'm, I'm um, wondering if we have obligations to go well beyond, you know, the, the, the normal call of duty. Again, I guess part of what's at issue is whether this is in the normal call of duty or not. Set to do something that beyond that certain area, you know, and that may only be five percent of the population. Yeah, in my mind. Back here. Well, what if you? I mean, what if? What if it's like a thirteen-year-old boy beating up a whole woman? Aren't you, in that sense, obligated to stop it? I mean, you can. Well that's a very good situation. question, and that's that's part of my. Are you obliged to stop it, or can you say? I mean, I guess the question is, can you say this? This is awful. Uh, but I have, to, you know, I'm, I have. It's within my rights to protect myself. I, I will not get involved. I mean, that's the that's the question that's sort of before the society at large right now. I mean, this is the question I place before you. It's a question that certainly has lots of uh, uh, ramifications within professional settings, but just in general. Yes. But somebody that has a gun... Depends on the 13-year-old kid. <laughs> you know, like, you should be able to report that so that somebody that has, like, proper power to retrieve that from somebody that... You're distinguishing between two important... I mean, there's, there's, you know, there are... I mean, there's we, we need not distinguish between rushing in and, uh, and putting your, li your own life at almost certain risk on the one hand between doing absolutely nothing on the other. I mean, those are not necessarily the only things involved here. It might be that short of going in there and giving away your life, which might actually be what you're doing in some cir circumstances, uh, that there are other things that you could try to do that you could act on that would be, have some chance of being effective. Um, Well, no. Uh, because, you know, I, so I, you're, you're talking about, you're, you're, you're thinking about definitions here. Uh, you could, I think there's always going to be someone that's, that's willing to give that much to be a hero. <coughs> uh, you know, there's a burning car, there's five children inside. There could be 10,000 people around the car. There's going to be one person that's going to go into that car. I, I'm not sure whether this is true or not. I've always thought that, you know, if that, you know, that the, it's almost a question of reactions. Uh, yeah, I think, I think Rather than just game. thinking about something and making a decision, you just either react or you don't. Is that what you're saying? Uh, here. Reversing the rules a little bit. Uh, you, but then I, I forgot. Reversing the rules a little bit. If you're the person being attacked, yeah. and someone comes along, and they have the opportunity, perhaps, to help you, but they don't, then you'd consider that person perhaps unethical. Then you would think maybe that they would have the obligation to help you. Again, I don't know whether I would feel they had the obligation. I mean, I, 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 uh, I'm very conscious right now that I think about things in a certain way that uh, and it's being challenged but I mean it seems to me that if I were in the position of the person being attacked I would think of it as something that was very much beyond the call of duty if another person who I didn't know rushed in and risked themselves to help me now I'd want them to <laughs> like I'd want to be helped I mean there's no doubt about that but I mean if I'm I don't know whether I would you know if if it were some small thing they could have done that would have saved me, that really was no cost to them, then I might think, yes, they have an obligation to do that, and I have an obligation to do small things, uh, moderate things. I have an obligation not, for example, to be uh, completely indifferent to what goes on. I mean, that'd be, that's, 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 that's wrong, in my view. I'm not sure that I think that people have an obligation to risk themselves to help 
others. Uh, I think that's something, it's something that goes beyond obligation. In, in um, philosophy, they have a term which may come up in the book. I'll mention it now. Unless it comes up in the book, you may forget it immediately after I mention it. But they say some acts are super erogatory, meaning they're not obligatory. They go beyond obligations. They are things that uh, we praise. I mean, people who merely meet their obligations are not, I mean, they're, that's, they shouldn't be the sub objects of praise in particular, because after all, these are obligations. People who have obligations and meet them are just doing what they ought to do. People who go beyond that and do something heroic are, uh, as again, here's that term again, they're doing something super erogatory. They're going beyond the call of duty, and that has to be a separate category from obligations. People do not, they, people really morally must meet their obligations, but people, uh, if this distinction is correct, would not morally, uh, they wouldn't be obliged to go to, to do, to be a hero. Now, what's intriguing is the suggestion that you raise. <laughs> we'll come back to you, because I, mean, I mean, I'm not sure that you're wrong about this, that there may be some sense in which, no, you know, we, we really ought to try to be heroes. I like that. <laughs> I, I find that romantic, and I think that's something that is, a, is, is, a, is an interesting approach, here and then in the back. And then, uh, did you, too? Okay. So we're um, kind of on the question of professional ethics, though. Um, yes. Back where I live, I'm a registered lifeguard. Yeah. And being off-duty. I was driving down one of the back roads where I live, and a little girl came up the road, waving her hand, screaming her mother's drowning. Now, by saving her, was that within my professional ethics, or is that That's interesting. More I mean, because you weren't on the job. I mean, on the one hand, on the job, of course, you, you would have to do that. I mean, that would be, that's your job. But what you're not on the job, and so you, uh, you have the skills, you have the training, so you're in a better position than many other people to do the saving, but it's not without risk. I mean, going off, you know, no matter how well you trained you are, going off and saving something who's kicking and, and drowning is a risky business. And that's a good question. I don't answer it for you. What do you think? I don't know. It's just the questions have been coming up, just the way the Rambo type stuff's been going. It was just a question. Well, what do you think? Do you think that, the, did it feel like, I mean, how did it feel to you? Did you feel obliged, obligated, as not just a passerby, because I think we'd all have some obligation to do something, if we could, to help throw something, you know, anything to help. But here you are, a trained lifeguard. You're not on duty. What did you feel? Well, after doing it, it's not any different than being at a pool or, you know, the lake where I'm lifeguarding at because it's the same mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's just a sense that if I wouldn't have done it, there's just a sense <coughs> that my professional job would have been totally different than it would be being paid to do something other than just actually doing it. Mm -hmm. But you didn't have a feeling in particular about its being an obligation or not one or the other? I kind of felt it was more or less it was an obligation. moral obligation than it was a professional obligation to do it. Okay, and I actually I'm, I'm, I'm happy that you put it that way. I don't mean to, again, I want to insist. I don't think that there are separate things called professional obligations that we have. My approach to this is to suggest that we have moral obligations, but sometimes we have different ones because of our professional training. I mean, that your obligation, because you're trained in that way, uh, might be different from someone who couldn't swim. Okay, just to, just to take a, 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 an extreme example. You still online? Okay, we got there, there, and there, right back there. I don't think it's a question of societal obligation. I think it's more of a, uh, a personal obligation. Okay, okay, a little louder, please. I think it's more of a personal obligation in that each person has their own set of morals and they're obligated as to their own set of morals and with each profession you'll find consistently a certain type of person that does that <coughs> profession and with each person they have some common morals and each one will most likely respond according to their morals and be obligated according to their own personal morals. We're going to have occasion next time to talk about what uh, I'll call uh, rel you know, relativism within ethics. And it, it suggests something like this idea that there are, there's actually different moralities and different uh, uh, principles of ethics uh, 
in different groups, professional groups perhaps, uh, certainly different societies. We'll talk about that a little more next time. But let me ask you right now, uh, let's say uh, that, that, that you're right, that this group has a certain kind of uh, moral uh, rule that is observed within that profession, and this has a different one over here. What, uh, what do we on the outside have to say about their behavior? Isn't there anything that kind of, you know, we're outside the profession. Let's, let's say we don't think they're behaving morally. Can they just say, well, we're following our rules? I mean, right. Basically, to me, I don't judge anyone because of their own set of morals. Uh -huh. I have my own personal set of morals, and that's what I follow by. And those are the morals that I live my life by, and I don't expect them to live by my morals. Well, I rip, you're, we're going we're gonna to have a good time in the discussion on Thursday, because I want to hear more from you on Thursday. But right there, there, and then now here. OK, right there semi-conflicting to me to, once you start saying it's obligatory or it's an obligation then being a hero doing heroic acts they, they aren't heroic anymore because there's no reward I mean you put a hero on a pedestal if it's an obligation it's like oh they did their job it's not being heroic or you just take every take all of that out of it I think people have their own code of ethics and they feel morally compelled to do what they can according to that Okay, so here, once again, the theme about their own code of ethics. I think you're both, uh, both are going to be interested, I hope, in the discussion on Thursday. But the, as regards, I mean, that's a very important point, as regards the relationship between the things that we say are obligations and the things that we say are heroic. We sort of take something out of things when they say, oh, well, they're just obligations. And uh, we, we, I mean, at least there's, a, there's a, the danger of this, that we wind up making them seem, uh, yeah, so what, big deal. And when, when they really are a big deal, uh, maybe we should recognize that they go well beyond what, what it's legitimate to normally expect of a person. And I guess the, what it's legitimate to normally expect of a person, all things considered, that's what, you know, what I've been thinking about is obligations. The stuff that goes beyond that, that's what I've been thinking about is sort of heroic acts. But I still, I'm really intrigued by the possibility that uh, you know, it's really not okay just to do your obligations. I mean, that's a, that's a very interesting, tricky, and puzzling thought. And I'm, I'm taken by it. I mean, I think it's an, a neat eye. I mean, I think there's something true in that, that it's not quite okay just to do the things you're obliged to do. And I, and, and I don't, that, that there's, a, there's some logical problems in there that trouble me, but I, I, I don't know what the resolution is. Here. Um, my cousin, um, Ruth on the ambulance corner, now he works for the sheriff's department, and he once told me that um, if you are trained in any life-saving um, capacity or whatever, and you see someone who's in trouble and you don't help them, you can be liable for their life. And I'd, I'd also like to say, um, I think it's a nice comment over here, um, I think you don't have to be professional. I think you could be a doctor. As long as you save someone's life, you're, you're going to be viewed as a hero and that person dies. So, you so even all right, but but in particular, even if uh, it is obligatory upon you, even if you are obliged to do it morally, given the skills that you've got, given the knowledge that you have, whatever, that you're 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 saying you don't you don't really think that is going to detract from the from the um, from the regard that other people will give you if you've saved the li saved the life, then uh, you're thought is, it doesn't matter that it might have been obligatory, that you will still be given credit. I mean, you might not be like worldly, worldwide known as a hero, but to that person's life that you saved, you're going to be viewed as a hero. To so that person and to the person's close to that person, perhaps. Or when you look at professional aspects, you look at athletes, how they're supposed to, they're such role models, they're, and some of the athletes believe that they're, because they're athletes, they, um, they're not obligated to be role models, but in actuality, they are. So you would because go, of the circumstances they're in, they can't help it. They can't help it. And I think, like, if you're looking at a doctor, they're a hero. I mean, they can help it. But, I mean, when they save someone's life, that, I think that's just that's their job. So to help assist people. So they're not, they're not obligated, but I think that's their, that's their moral right to do that. Well, well or, or obligated. But they, you're saying they're not obligated, but... It goes with the territory or something? Because I'm trying to relate yeah, that to the athlete thing. Yeah. 
Well, I guess uh, let's switch over instead. Of, you know, stop talking about hero heroics and heroes and stuff, or, maybe, or at least talk about heroes of another kind in another sort of sense. And I mean, I'm interested in the athlete kind of situation. I'm in, interested in the in the case you bring up because uh, people might. Find, I think this happens a lot. It's not just that people might, but people <coughs> find themselves occupying places in society that they have struggled for for one reason, but they find that these places have all kinds of trappings they don't want. Uh, people might feel like they have to change their lifestyles because they come into the public uh, in, the, in the public eye. And athletes, as you suggest, uh, you're suggesting you think they do have obligations once they become role models. They have obligations to what? I mean, to change their lives. Um, I mean, let's say you know you got somebody who just really doesn't lead a very admirable life, but they don't hurt anybody. They just don't lead a particularly admirable life. They like doing all kinds of things that aren't regarded as as uh, wonderful things to do in front of kids, but again, they're not hurting anybody, and let's say they're not violating anybody's rights, suddenly they're out in the glare of publicity. Do they have an obligation to change their lives? That's what they're arguing about. That's what the athletes who say no, and they say, look, I'm, I'm here to play basketball, or I'm here to play, you know, I'm here to do this. I'm not here to be a role model. I didn't ask to be a role model. I just want to do this. What do you think? I think <laughs> for the profession, they, even though they don't want to be a role model, mm -hmm. they're a role model no matter what. Because the kids are seeing them, they basically see them on television doing their thing. But when they, when they see them like off camera and something happens where they're not acting like, like these kids think they should be mm -hmm. acting, mm -hmm. I think they can look at that aspect too because they're not, they're not, they don't want to be role models. I don't believe they do. It's just comes, like you said before, it comes with the territory. Mm -hmm. Well, so what obligations do they have? Anybody, I want to keep you on the spot, yeah. Now they're favoring a certain group, kids, because they're influencing them. Make that clear, I, I, I think I see the point, but I mean. Well, that's just like an athlete, like the athlete in particular, they're influence, they're being an influence on society. Right, and in this particular case, kids. Kids, yeah. But, uh, that's for one profession, but what about like the other professionals? You mean who are not in the, not athletic? Yeah, uh, like medicine, and they're not influencing. Any well, arguably, of teachers are supposed to be provide role models for their kids, and so teachers have you know are supposed to you know like throughout you know especially at the in the younger levels, but uh, there's some concern that teachers uh, present themselves in certain ways, not just that they know the stuff that they have to teach. And that they uh, and that they present it well so that the students get it, but that they be a certain way. I mean, that's uh, whether I don't know how you, I don't know how you think about that, uh, but uh, that certainly is a pretty standard expectation of teachers. You know, right through college. I mean, but but especially at the lower levels, the the younger and the more influential kids are regard uh, influenceable kids are regarded. Uh, the, the more concern there is for the, for the modeling behavior, uh, the, the way that the, the teachers present themselves. It's going to be very burdensome. I mean, I, you, uh, you, you must understand, this is not, you know, it's not just athletes, for example, not just big stars and stuff, but this, these sorts of things can be very, very burdensome. And, uh, and I guess a lot of people would argue that they are part and parcel of the obligations that attach to those professions, at least to some extent, I mean, with with at some there's some privacy. I mean, the other there's the other side about people's right to privacy, people's right to live their lives as they choose to lead them. These are ethical issues involving how professionals present themselves. Um, there are some very straightforward and direct sorts of obligations that people have by virtue of the professions that they're in. Like as a teacher, I shouldn't be telling you lies, right? Uh, you, I mean, I owe that. I mean, I don't have to. I don't have to put up a little sign. The following things are going to be true today. I mean, I, don't have to, I shouldn't have to put up a sign like that. You should presume that I'm not telling you lies. Fact is, it's all lies. No, uh, <laughs> you know, you have a reasonable presumption that I'm going to be telling you stuff that, as far as I know, is true. But more than that, you have a reasonable presumption, a, a rightful presumption that, the, as far as I know, part isn't just me winging it. I mean, I should have looked this. I should have examined some of this stuff. I should have some expertise if I'm up here presenting myself as a teacher. And you have a right to expect that. 
there's all kinds of other rights that you have. I suspect uh, I'm not going to start cataloging it because it'll sound self-serving, but in my own view, I think there's a lot of rightful expectations I have as a teacher of you as students. But uh, again, I mean, you can figure out what those are yourselves. Uh, there's certain things that go with the relationship. Go with the relationship. And some of them have to do with the fact that you're paying money for this. Others, others of it have, would, would be true even if it were all free. I mean, it would, you know, even if the education were free, you weren't paying money for it, uh, there would be, just because of the, of the relationship, teacher-student relationship, I'd have some things that I'd have a right to presume, you'd have some things you'd have the right to, uh, a right to presume, and these are mimicked in all kinds of professional and quasi-professional relationships. Were there some hands that I, got, I missed and ignored? OK. Um, I don't want to milk this uh, much longer. This is this, this is, these are the sorts of issues. These are samples, examples of, this, of the kinds of things that are fundamental to uh, considerations of professional ethics. And as you see, it's real difficult to keep them separated from just ethics proper. And we're trying to figure out, how should we behave? I mean, that's the general question of ethics. And um, professional ethics is just, how should people behave in professional settings? And the difference isn't that there's some separate set of rules in those professional settings. It's just that the professional settings offer certain characteristic sets of circumstances that just make things different. And the fact that you're trained, for example, that you have a certain knowledge, and that you present yourself as someone with this knowledge, as you, and offering a service, I mean, that just creates obligations and rightful expectations. And the, this is about all there is, I mean, just sort of a general gloss to profession, professional ethics. Uh, what we're going to do next time, as I think I mentioned to you, is to, to go into, um, into some considerations of ethical theory. <coughs> what I want to do is to start out with a discussion of uh, something that might not seem like an ethical theory. It might actually seem antithetical to ethics. And that's the whole idea of ethical relativism. We want to explore that for a little while, contrast it with something that's got a bad name, but which I'm going to come out kind of in favor of, ethical absolutism. Okay? We're going to contrast relativism with absolutism. And then we're going to go on uh, to discuss, I hope, next time. If not next time, then Tuesday, uh, we'll discuss a particular ethical theory called ethical egoism. And then finally, before we get to professional ethics proper, and this certainly will be next Tuesday. Uh, I'll be talking about um, um, at least two theories, and perhaps three. One says that what's right and wrong depends on the consequences of actions. Another one says that what's right and wrong depends on uh, on the uh, on, on certain characteristics of the actions themselves. And the third ethical theory. Uh, says that actions aren't really as important as how a person is, certain char you know, character traits of a person in, in determining right and wrong. In the meantime, if there are no further comments or questions, uh, I'm through for today, and uh, see you next time. <laughs>